The coolest thing about the new standalone Walksnail video receiver is that you can use it on a lot of the analog goggles that you already own. As long as they've got an HDMI input, they could theoretically take an image from the video receiver and you could fly. But the experience of using it with those goggles is going to vary widely. Some of them have lower resolution screens and won't do a good job with the higher resolution image that the video receiver sends. Some of them have four three screens and may not handle the 16.9 widescreen image correctly and the latency is going to be very different on different sets of goggles. That's why I reached out to the folks on my Discord server and asked them, do you have an old set of analog goggles that might work with the Walksnail video receiver? And would you be willing to lend them to me so I could test them? And that's what we're going to do in this video. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Let's start the video by looking at the Walksnail avatar goggles. Oh, oh, no, wait, these are the Fat Shark Dominator goggles. Sorry, they're, they're the same goggle. They're just different colors. Don't worry about it. And what I'm going to do in just a second is put a GoPro in the eyepiece of these goggles and show you what the screen looks like. And I'm doing that because I think there's some nuances of the way that some of these different goggles handle the image that you can only get by actually looking in the eyepiece of the goggles and seeing them. But I hesitate to do this and I want you to keep in mind that what the GoPro is showing you is not exactly perfectly everything about the experience of seeing the goggles. For example, um, some of the screens are going to be much brighter. Some of the screens are going to be a little bit dimmer. I've tried to compensate for that by keeping the exposure of the GoPro locked, but still it's not the same as seeing a bright OLED screen blasting your eyeballs with light versus a dimmer LCD screen, which it doesn't have as much light. The dynamic range of the images that you're seeing, the highlights and shadow details, that's limited by what the GoPro can show you, which is not perfectly the same as what your eyeball would show. So don't over-focus on things like image quality. If the image is a little bit skewed, that's probably just because the GoPro wasn't straight on. But focus on the things that I actually am trying to draw your attention to. Uh, well, anyway, hopefully you're okay with that trade-off. So for example, don't focus on the fact that the focus on this shot of the Dominator goggle is less than perfect. The image is a little bit out of focus and blurry. It was very hard looking at the GoPro's tiny little screen to turn that knob and get the image perfectly focused. Obviously it would be in focus if you're using it in real life. But what I want you to see is the relative size of the image. This is a 46 degree field of view and it uh, should be pretty representative as we put the GoPro in the different goggle screens. Some of them will be smaller, some will be larger, and that should be roughly proportional to what you would see if you put your face in those goggles. I also want you to keep in mind that this is a native 16.9 screen. It's a 10, 1920 by 1080 resolution. Some of the other goggles are going to be native 4.3, and that's going to affect the size and how the image is presented. Next, let's compare to the Skyzone Skyo 4X. And this goggle stands out because it is one of the leading contenders for a great analog goggle. Uh, it's got a large 1280 by 960 screen with a big 46 degree field of view, which might lead you to believe that it's the same size field of view as the Dominator goggle, which is also advertised as having 46 degree field of view. But as we can see in this comparison, that's not true. And the reason for that is that the Dominator goggle here on the left has a 16.9 wide screen. And so that 46 degrees is being measured across this wider shorter image, whereas the 4.3 screen of the Skyzone Skyo 4X also has a 46 degree field of view, but because it's a taller image, you end up actually with a larger image, more area of the screen is taken up. The closer the screen is to a square, the more area of the image you get for the diagonal field of view. So the Skyzone is going to give you a larger image, or is it? Because this image you're looking at right now is actually stretched. The Walksnail video receiver puts out a widescreen 720p or 1080p image. And what the Skyzone goggle is doing right now is stretching that to fill its 4.3 screen. This is one of the things you've got to pay attention to as you're thinking about what goggle you're going to use with the Walksnail VRX. If the goggle has a 4.3 screen, as many older analog goggles did, then they may or may not correctly handle the widescreen image that's coming in. But the good news is that the Skyzone Skyo 4X has a menu option that lets it handle this correctly. In the display menu, there is an aspect ratio option that changes from 4.3 to 16.9. And you can see here, when I change it to 16.9, it is letterboxing the image inside that 4.3 display and correctly displaying it. 
So now we can see that the field of view of the two images is roughly equal, and that's what you'd expect. They both advertise a 46 degree field of view. When you then match the aspect ratio, they have approximately the same size image. And since Waxnell cameras today only support 16:9 widescreen, the larger screen of the Skyo4X actually isn't giving you any advantage, at least not when used with the Waxnell system. Next up, let's take a look at the Orca FPV-1. And this is a super high-end goggle, but it's starting to fall behind a little bit in its specs compared to some of the other goggles that we're gonna look at, including the HD Zero goggle. And the spec that it falls behind most in is the field of view. So the Dominator and the Skyzone Skyo4X both have a 46 degree field of view, a nice large image. The Orca has a 38 degree field of view, and that field of view is with a 4.3 screen. So by the time you letterbox a 16.9 image inside that 4.3 screen, it gets even smaller. And I haven't done the math on the exact number, but I think it's down closer to like 33 degrees field of view. And I'm not gonna go so far as to say that 33 degrees is unflyable. In fact, the Orca FPV-1 Racing Edition has a 33 degree field of view that a lot of racers like because it puts more uh, they can see the whole screen basically without having to move their eyes around. But that assumes a 4.3 camera, which is gonna be a bigger image. A 33 degree 16.9 field of view is pretty freaking small. If I had the Orca goggles already and I wanted to try the Waxnail system, I certainly would not let that hold me back. But I don't think you're gonna get the full experience of the Waxnail system on these goggles or any goggle that has such a small field of view. Another area these goggles suffer a little bit, and this is surprising given how high performance and expensive these goggles are, is latency. But I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna do the YouTuber thing and save latency to the end of the video and talk about all the goggles at once rather than spread that information out throughout the video. Next up, the Fat Shark HDO2. Don't let the fact that I have an HD0 receiver on the front of that fool you. This is the Waxdale video receiver. And you might expect that the performance of the HD202 would be very similar to the performance of the Skyzone Skyo4X. They both have a 46 degree field of view and 1280 by 960 resolution screens. In fact, some have speculated that they have the exact same optics module inside of them. And in fact, the results do sort of bear that out. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the Fat Shark, that's here in the lower right, does not have the ability to switch between 4.3 and 16.9 on the HDMI input. And I actually tested this previously, and I thought I remembered that it was showing 4.3 stretched, but I've just double checked and we can clearly see that the HDO2 is not stretching. This is the 16.9 image, and it is letterboxing correctly, so I'm not sure what happened there. I, it's the same set of goggles. It does seem to be doing it correctly today. Maybe I was wrong when I said that earlier. I'm not sure. The size of the image is very comparable to the other three goggles, all of whom have the 46 degree field of view. This Fat Shark is a little bit less configurable than the Sky Zone, uh, but it seems like it will get the job done. Next, we'll look at the Eosheen EV200D. And in case you've forgotten all about this goggle, it has a 1280 by 720p screen, so it will be able to display the 720p feed from the Waxnail video receiver in its native resolution. If you choose to use 1080p, then it will downscale it and you'll get some reduction in image quality. The field of view is 42 degrees, so just a little bit smaller than the 46 degree field of view on these other goggles. And you can see what that looks like here in the upper right. This one is not an OLED screen. And this is a case where the GoPro definitely is not fully giving you the impact of the difference between an OLED screen and an LCD screen. At least in my opinion, the brighter, more saturated, darker blacks of an OLED screen are just make a big, big difference in my subjective experience of using the goggles. It just looks pretty much the same here on our when we're just looking at the GoPro. The Skyzone Cobra X might be the most interesting goggle in this roundup. They are a box goggle instead of a sort of binocular style goggle. And that means that their price is significantly lower than any of the other goggles you see here, coming in around $250. They have a really good analog module in them. Uh, so they are pretty appealing for analog pilots on a budget. And the hope would be that they would also then be able to step into a digital system by adding the Walksnail video receiver. The screens 
R1280 by 720, and thanks to it being a box goggle, there is a massive 50 degree field of view, which looks like this. Yes, the field of view of the Cobra X is huge, uh, but even with the deficiencies of the GoPro, which you can see reflected in the lens in front of the screen there, you can see that this is a much inferior display. It is dim, it is nowhere in the same league as even the really good LCD displays that we've seen in some of the other goggles. I think that there probably would be hard to justify spending $250. You would be better off buying something like the Fat Shark Rec Recon goggles to do walk snail, although then you wouldn't have an analog goggle, so I don't know. It's a tough one. You probably just spend more money, actually. It would be my real recommendation. Of course, we can't overlook the HD Zero goggle, which has a unique feature that I think means it is the best goggle hands down for you to use with the Walksnail VRX. We'll get to that in just a second, but when it comes to the screen size and resolution, the performance of this goggle is similar to a lot of the ones we've already seen. Here on the right, we've got the HD Zero goggle, and on the left, we've got the SkyZone Skyo 4X. Both of them have a 46 degree field of view, so when fed a 16.9 image, they have exactly the same screen size. Remember, the SkyZone has a native 4.3 screen, so if working with a 4.3, or three analog image, then the sky zone is gonna have a much larger image. But as long as we're talking about the walk snail system, which only supports 16.9 cameras, we're gonna see very similar screen size between the sky zone, the HD zero, and uh, sure, the dominator. Dominator's gonna be very similar. In fact, the HDO two gonna be very similar as well. But they're not gonna be similar in terms of their resolution. And that's what we should talk about next. Any of these goggles that have at least 720 horizontal pixels worth of resolution are gonna be able to display the 1280 by 720p image without resizing it. So 1280 by 960 resolution on a SkyZone Sky 4 x you're good to go. But if you were using 1920 by 1024, then you can see that that 1024 horizontal pixels is bigger than the 960 that the SkyZone has, and it would need to resize that image down somewhat. I don't have an example here of a goggle with less than 720 pixels of horizontal resolution, but if you go back far enough, there are goggles with a resolution of like 800 by 600, and in that case, you would also be rescaling the 720p image. I think a lot of people are gonna be satisfied with the results that they get from that because they're just gonna be happy to be flying any digital system at all, and they're gonna feel like it's better than the analog system that they were using. Some people are gonna feel that way, but for the best possible experience, you're gonna to wanna to pair the Walksnail system with a, with, a, with a goggle that has at least 720 pixels of horizontal resolution. Whether that's a 16.9 or a 4.3 screen will only affect the field of view, not the ability to display those pixels. The other feature that's gonna differentiate these goggles is their ability to support 100 FPS versus 60 FPS frame rate. All of these goggles were able to support both 720p and 1080p resolution at 60 frames per second. But as you'll see when we get to the latency discussion, the latency of 60 frames per second is higher than the latency of 100 frames per second. And only one of these goggles can actually display a 100 FPS input. Before we, before I reveal what goggle that is, you've probably guessed it already, I wanna just take a second and address an argument people make when we talk about frame rate and latency. People say that if you have 100 frames per second or 120 frames per second, that doesn't actually affect the latency. It only affects how often you see new information on screen. Now that is, that is incorrect. But even if that were correct, seeing a smoother image, a smoother moving picture, because you're getting more frequent updates still has some benefit. But what's missing from that analysis is, uh, think of it this way. I think this is how people are thinking of it. They're thinking of it like the frame of video data is being put on a conveyor belt and the conveyor belt carries that image across to the other side and then it comes off the other side and it's displayed on the screen. And that when you go to a higher frame rate, you are putting more sort of boxes on that conveyor belt, but the conveyor belt didn't speed up. And so the, the time it takes the video frame to get from one side of the conveyor belt to the other side is the same, therefore higher frame rate should not mean lower latency. And that analysis would be correct, except that it also takes time to display the image. 
So imagine that when you get to the other end of the conveyor belt, you have to take the box off the conveyor belt and open up the box and take the picture out and display it on screen. And here's the thing. You must display the image before the next image shows up. So if I'm running a screen at 100 frames per second, it must, by definition, take me less than 1 over 100th of a second to display the images. If I'm showing 1 over uh, 60 frames per second, it takes me 1 over 60 seconds to display the image, and so on. Because a higher frame rate requires the image to be displayed faster, therefore higher frame rates also result in lower latency by definition. But how much difference do those frame rates make? That's where this chart comes into play. The latency of the system has one of the biggest single effects in how connected you feel to the quadcopter while you're flying. Low latency is incredibly important, especially if you're flying at high speeds or in close proximity to obstacles where a fast reaction can make the difference between crashing and pulling off the trick that you're trying to pull. And when you use goggles like the Dominator goggles, the latency of the system is determined by the manufacturer and is baked in. But when you use a Walksnail VRX with a third-party set of goggles, the latency could be, well, who knows? I know, because I measure the latency of all these goggles. And I'm going to show you what it is right after this. Patreon.com is a website where you can subscribe to me. For as little as $2 a month, or more if you feel like I've earned it, the amount that you subscribe at is completely up to you, and you can stop whenever you want. Patreon is the single best way for you to support the work that I do here at the channel. YouTube ad revenue can go up and down. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, but Patreon is a consistent amount of monthly income that I can rely on to, well, uh, pay my bills, but also pay for shipping so people can mail me a whole bunch of goggles that I can test and do other things that contributes directly to the hopefully valuable content that you're watching right now. If today's the day that you have decided you want to support me on Patreon, there's a link down in the video description. I'd love to have you as a supporter. If today isn't the day, that's fine. I just keep making the content. It's not like I can stop. And uh, I hope you'll keep watching the content and maybe that day will come. I've discussed in the past how I measure the glass-to-glass -glass latency of the system, but I'll just recap it here real quick in case it's your first time. I have an LED light, which you see here, and I record with a GoPro at 240 frames per second that light turning on, both in the goggle itself and in the GoPro itself. If we wait for the light to turn on, like so, then if we count how many frames it takes for the light to appear in the goggle, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Ten frames. Ten frames. 240 frames per second. It's approximately four milliseconds per frame, and therefore that means our glass-to-glass -glass latency is about 40 milliseconds. You can see some ways in which this method is not perfect. First of all, because I only have a 240 frame per second camera, I can only measure down with four milliseconds of precision. So if there was a, one uh, goggle that had six milliseconds and one that had eight milliseconds, I wouldn't be able to differentiate them reliably. The other complication is that it's not always perfectly clear which frame should be the one that we count as the start of the light. So we can see here that the light is starting to turn on and now it's fully on, and that might throw us off by one frame in either direction. I actually, I've ordered some little LED diodes instead of using a great big LED panel that will turn on uh, quicker and more definitively. But at the end of the day, I still am only gonna get four milliseconds of resolution. Nevertheless, we can still draw some meaningful conclusions. And we're gonna start down here at the bottom of the chart with the fastest, lowest latency, which is the Dominator goggles running at 720p and 100 frames per second. All of these tests have been done in 25 megabit per second mode. Uh, Chris Rosser has some latency testing that he's done that demonstrates that 50 megabits per second has a little bit lower latency than 25 millisecond pretty much across the board. That's it. I have no idea why. That's interesting, though. Um, I'll put a link to his video down in the video description if you want to check it out. He also has a 100 frame per second camera, or 1,000, 1,000 frame per second camera, I think is what he's using. So he gets a little bit more precision in his numbers than I do. Um, but we'll keep going. The Dominator goggles at 720p 100, I measured as a resolution of about 33 milliseconds. The HD Zero goggles at 720p 100, I measured at about 40 
2 milliseconds. And I was surprised to get this result because the HD Zero goggles have been highly tuned to be extremely low latency and high performance. In fact, Carl from HD Zero says he thinks the latency of the HDMI input on the goggles is about 2 milliseconds or less. What If we assume that that information is accurate, then that suggests that the additional latency here, here is coming from the VRX. It's, I don't know where it is. I was going to grab it for a prop and hold it up. It assumes that there's some latency on the HDMI output of the VRX itself, and that's where that extra, uh, what, 8 milliseconds, 9 milliseconds is coming from. That's unfortunate because the HD Zero goggle, the hope would be that it would perform just as well as the Dominator goggle and you wouldn't be giving anything up. And in fact, in a previous test where I measured only 60 frames per second, I concluded that that was the case. But now that I'm measuring 100 frames per second, I see that that is not true. And that's unfortunate. Oh, by the way, this goggle, the HD Zero goggle, it's the only one that can do 100 frames per second. So all the other goggles, you're going to be at 60 frames per second, and you're going to have even higher latency. How much higher? Here's the HDO2 goggle at 60 frames per second and the Dominator HD goggle at 60 frames per second, both of them coming in at about 42 milliseconds. And everything goes up a little bit from there. The Skyzone Skyo 4X at 60 frames per second, coming in at about 46 milliseconds, and then at 1080p, also at about 46 milliseconds. I was kind of curious whether the Skyzone goggle would be slower at 1080 for some reason, and it wasn't, at least not within the precision of my measurements. The Orca goggles did surprisingly poorly, coming in at 50 milliseconds. I guess the HDMI input hasn't been really optimized for low latency. Keep in mind that the Orca goggles do have a separate digital input interface that's supposed to be used with the Orca FPV system, perhaps that would have lower latency if anybody was actually using it for anything, but the HDMI input doesn't seem particularly fast. The EV200D at 54 milliseconds, and then we have the HD Zero goggles uh, at 720p60 with a really bad showing of about 67 milliseconds. But there's a catch here. The HD Zero goggles are still being tuned and optimized, and all of the work has gone into the 100 frame per second mode, which, keep in mind, HD Zero didn't, use, didn't originally support at all. Uh, the HD Zero engineers say that they will be further optimizing this, and we should expect that number to come down. But at the current time, if you're using HD Zero with HDMI, at 60 frames per second, the latency is really bad. You definitely want to be using 100 frames per second with the walk snail system. And then lastly, we have the Cobra X. And uh, the Cobra X came in at 75 whopping milliseconds, which is a damn shame because I, can, I would consider anything from s somewhere above 50 milliseconds, I would consider it to be completely unacceptable. Certainly by 100 milliseconds, it's uh, almost unflyable. Certainly in proximity to objects, maybe like up in the sky, you could fly at 100 milliseconds. But uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 milliseconds, I'm just not happy with it at all. And 75 milliseconds is to me, I would just not even con really consider them for this purpose. <sighs> Frankly, none of these numbers are like spectacularly good compared to the 16-ish milliseconds of the HD0 system itself. And remember, these numbers are best case on the bench, six inches away from each other. As soon as you go out and you start flying, these numbers are going to go up, right? Because the further away you get, the more lost packets there are, the higher the latency gets. So if you look at this and you say, well, 42 milliseconds is okay, maybe it is, but you're going to get another 10 or 15 milliseconds, perhaps, as you fly away. It's not great. It's not, it's not great. If you are trying the walk snail system, it's what you got, and it might be good enough for some people. Dominator still holds the lead, though. For the absolute lowest latency with the walk snail system, the dom you can't beat the Dominator HD goggles. But a lot of people aren't going to buy the walk snail goggle. M maybe you don't want to spend $600 on a goggle that can only be used with one system ever. Maybe you're going to buy the walk snail VRX for $200 and pair it with a set of goggles you've already got. Or maybe you'd rather spend $500-ish on the HD Zero goggles, which are arguably the best third-party goggle for walk snail, but also have some great features when used with HD Zero, like the new 90 FPS camera, which is a total freaking game changer. 
and they're pretty darn good analog goggles too. I'm gonna put a couple cards on screen to the review of the HD Zero goggles, the review of the Cadex VRX, and oh crap, I can't do three cards, the review of the 90 FPS camera. No, that's the one I'm gonna do, because that's a total game changer. There's links down in the video description as well, and you should definitely check those videos out uh, if you're in the market for goggles. I'll see you there.